Welcome. This is Thursday, and so we're interviewing uh, our guests that uh, will tell us some things that are going on in our community, especially through the school district. And so, Mike, thank you for being here. This is Mike Johnson, the, the superintendent of our schools. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me again. I, I certainly am enjoying these weekly meetings and interviews. Um, today we have a, a special guest. We have uh, Joel Higdon here, and uh, fittingly so. Uh, when we first shut down, um, or when the governor first shut down the schools, uh, initially we had to get together to start setting things up mm -hmm. uh, for the district. Uh, communications, uh, food distribution, uh, delivery of food and uh, and the safety of the facilities we had to uh, immediately sanitize the facilities all of this fell to Joel and we were in constant communication I think all day long uh, for probably the first week and then we kind of branched out into the rest of the team of the district to start going into the other areas to to move school out to the to homes uh, to our kids but um, right. thanks for letting us be here. Oh, absolutely. We're uh, thrilled that you can do it again. We really are. Joel, welcome. Yeah, yeah thank you. You are, the, um, you are the Director of Technology Services, and you're the, the Director of Facility Operations, mm -hmm. and you're the District Safety Officer. Now, that's a unique job. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about it. Sure. Um, which one first? I don't care. You don't care? Okay. Well, uh, so the, the technology services is where I actually uh, started. Um, well, actually, I originally started with the school district as the campus supervisor, basically the dean of students at Crestle Middle School. I did that for two years, and then I transitioned into um, technology. Uh, at that time, there it was just a technology director. And uh, interesting note, all my predecessors have gone on to be superintendents, and Colt Guild ended up, he, I, he had my job originally back. So, interesting side note, and I'm sitting there going, people sometimes who know that will say, are you? I'm like, nope, I'm very happy where I'm at. <laughs> um, but that was technology services, and then I took mm -hmm. on facilities about five years later, uh, and, uh, and then district safety officer kind of roped into the facility side of things. Mm -hmm. So, technology services is literally just everything that has to do with uh, technology, which is also includes phone systems. Some districts uh, farm out that work. We don't, so I support, the, my, my, our staff supports um, the phones in our district supports all the technology, which is projectors and document cameras and computers and what have you. Um, the facility operations is essentially everything that, from cleaning the buildings to maintaining the facilities and leaving and having the doors open, so that folks can come into the hallways and enjoy the facilities and and learn. Um, obviously, that's all been a whole new world in the last couple of weeks and months. But um, I always jokingly will say that. Because I wear those two hats, um, when I get um, a new staff member who comes in and they are outfitting their classroom, mm -hmm. it might be a staff, a teacher or whatever, uh, we teach them about how we use an online system to track requests. And so we have a trouble ticket system and we have work order system. And so I always find it a little amusing because I'll have a teacher say, well, how do I, who do I talk to about getting more computers in my classroom? I said, oh, you it's me, but you'll do it through a trouble ticket. So we have a triage and we kind of uh -huh. put the, manage the request. And she says, oh, okay, great. Well, I want to put them over here. There's no outlet. So who do I talk to about getting the outlet? And I'm like, well, that's, that's me too. <laughs> and I said, you do a work request. And so, I, so then I realized if it's plugged in, I'm dealing with it. Yeah. And to some yeah. extent, if it's plugged into the district, I'm the one that's dealing with it. Whether it's the tool that's being plugged in or whether it's the plug in mm -hmm. itself. Gotcha. And the safety officer piece is actually every school district in the state of Oregon has a safety officer. And it's a position that is, rec it's, it's actually in the books with the state of Oregon. And so there's certain requirements that I have to sign off. There's things I have to document for the district. If we have any accidents, if we have any issues that occur, and that could be even at a bus stop. Um, 10 years ago, we had a bus get hit right outside this building here. And I was on scene on that yeah. as the safety officer. Um, and it's a lot, the safety officer piece is really just um, t looking at an, uh, reacting to an accident and doing a plan of action to prevent it from happening again and or recognizing situations and preventing the accidents from happening okay. in the first place. So that's sure. that's that piece All of right, operation. Thanks. Under normal operations, before COVID-19 hit us all, uh, still those are those are huge mm -hmm. jobs. Um, how many people do you have on your team? How does that work? Well, yeah, so we have seven custodial 
crew, uh, crew of seven, um, three at the elementary, two at the middle, and two at the high school. Mm -hmm. And that's considerably lower than way back in the day, but we work with seven, um, and we have supplement that with subs when we need to. Um, in technology, we have uh, one and a half people. Um, that's considerably lower than it used to be. We used to, back in the day, have two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have one lead maintenance and it's kind of interesting because there's only one maintenance guy, but he's the lead. Uh, but but I actually have that position earmarked that way because there was always been this framework that, you know, as time and money would allow, we would be able to bring in more staff to help. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not a huge crew, but it, but they're a, a skilled crew. They're mm -hmm. a, they, they have good hearts and they have good intentions and they do their jobs well. And frankly, because they do their job well, it helps yes. me and I help, you know, it's a great, it's a win. Awesome. It's a great win well, for the community. Uh, when, when we started today, Mike, you mentioned that right off when the pandemic hit us, mm -hmm. when the governor shut us down, you turned immediately to Joel um, in this transition to distance learning. How has this impacted you and your role? It was, it was a heavy lift. It really was. And we, you know, we shut down and, and our facilities were shut down to even some custodians and um, and those opening days, it was, it was really just uh, Mike and I, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and so we were doing a lot of uh, problem solving and planning as to what we were, and, and and every almost every day, if not every hour, we were getting different directions or different new information, but we knew certain things that that it, it was looking more increasingly like it was going to have to be some sort of online environment. And, you know, what does that online environment look like? Well, you, you're talking about distributing computers. So yeah. we brought back crews. Uh, so some of those very people I just mentioned number wise came back and uh, I actually posted a couple pictures on our website about that. Um, and so if people are interested in go to our website and, and go through the posts and find mm -hmm. those. I think the Chronicle wrote an article about it too, because we had facility staff, people who normally would be in a classroom cleaning were um, helping us gather technology. We literally went to every single classroom and pulled technology from all those classrooms because we didn't know what the demand was going to be. We, sure. we had no idea what the demand is. We have just about 1,300 students. Mm -hmm. Now, d does every one of those students need a computer? Well, we didn't have a 1,300 computers, but we have pretty close. I mean, we, 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 have, we could outfit half of them pretty mm -hmm. easily. But that's pulling every piece of technology. So that was the opening days. We literally pulled all technology and reconfigured them for an outside environment for learning and assignments that were outside the school brick and mortar. And then those same facility people, when they stopped helping us with that, we uh, around almost around the same time, we recognized that we needed to sanitize the buildings and get a uh, because we had an opportunity because of a bubble. No one had been in the buildings, mm -hmm. but yet people had been. But we yeah. the doors were shut, so we sanitized completely sanitized the buildings, which took time. I mean, that was a week long process um, spread out for the entire district, mm -hmm. and it was um, a serious amount of cleaning and sanitizing. And there was a huge scramble uh, of getting material. Um, um, I mentioned before we went on the podcast the little stories about the University of Oregon. I'm going to throw a little quick story about the University of Oregon in there. So on a Sunday, I realized the writing on the wall was supplies are going to start to get hit really hard. So I was with vendors online and on the phone on a Sunday, and I had in my inbox or my out my uh, my cart, if mm -hmm. you will, from one of our online vendors all these material. And I realized when I got to the cart, some of the stuff started disappearing. Well, it was because I wasn't fast enough because the real time inventory was beating up. So I found out on Monday that I was competing with the University of Oregon. <laughs> so I had ordered maybe a thousand dollars worth of material on that Sunday. They ordered thirty thousand dollars worth of material. Mm -hmm. And so you know when I was comp I was competing against them for I was looking for gloves. They were looking for gloves too. When I was looking for, and and, yeah. and I will say this was a real challenge because those early days we. We as a nation and we as a world, if you will, didn't really understand this virus. And to some extent, I, I suppose we could say we don't still. But but here's the thing. The list of approved EPA chemicals that could uh, comp you know, stop mm -hmm. the virus was like six items. Six things. Yeah. And as a state agency, as an agency, we could only do those six things. And, and the early on days, bleach wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. So people could, oh, I just could use bleach. 
Yeah. The, the EPA said, no, you can't use bleach. And so we, we were very narrow as to what we could buy. Now that's been changed because yeah. they've learned more about the, the virus and they've, the list has grown considerably. Mm -hmm. But so you had a very narrow market of where you could get these chemicals from and everybody under the sun was rushing to get them because we didn't know what we needed okay. to do. Yeah, so it was a very heavy lift, but it was a, it was a challenging lift, but I, I, I like challenges. <laughs> I actually, yeah. I look back at it and go, well, I probably got a few more gray hairs, but no one notices. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say that the entire district, all buildings and offices, classrooms were sanitized within a week. Wow. Yeah. We wouldn't let anybody in the yeah. buildings until they were sanitized and they, they sat mm -hmm. uh, for a while sanitized to make sure that we were yeah. uh, completely germ free. And I heard, yeah. I've heard people even recently say, well, there's hardly anybody in Cresswell that even has this virus. So what's the precaution? And what, what we're hearing, this is why nobody has it because you did those mm -hmm. things immediately. Exactly. I think it's that situation where you you prepare for the worst and hope for the best mm -hmm. um, we took it very seriously from the first from the onset yeah and um, and we set out with a plan to make sure that it, we were going to be preparing the facilities mm -hmm. to be safe for yeah. anyone that would come in them yeah the first word of your of your mission during this pandemic was connect mm -hmm. I think that involves you a little bit it does how'd you do that? Yeah, so we, we did a survey because we realized, uh, I mentioned a little while ago, but we, had, we didn't know how many students were going to need computers, but we had to prepare for the idea that we were going to have to have them all sent out. So we did a survey, and I was actually, I didn't know how much response we were going to get from that. We actually ended up getting close to, if not every person in our district responded to that because we had 1,295 responses. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's pretty good when you have a student population just under 1300 so uh, that, that yeah. tells me that that pretty much every every parent or mm -hmm. student responded to that survey and the survey added some specific questions but it gave us a framework or an understanding what the need was because mm -hmm. we needed to make that connection and we had some you know we needed to know what that connection needed to be and so we got a response back the initial numbers looked like we were going to need about 600 computers and so we had 600 computers ready we created a distribution plan. I used, um, this is when we started bringing in a few more people, education assistants who are working, mm -hmm. who are, um, who, who their traditional job of being in the classroom or, or on the playground or in the cafeteria was uh, paused, mm -hmm. but they were stepping up to help us in the distribution piece. And so using all the personal protection equipment that we had, we were, people were lining up in front of the schools and we were handing out devices. And then all in all, in the end, we ended up actually handing out five, just below 500, mm -hmm. or actually just above 500 devices. And then over the course of time, some folks actually came back. And I thought this was really neat. I, I thought this speaks well to our community mm -hmm. because we actually had folks who recognized, oh, you know what? I actually don't need this device. I want it available for someone else. So as it sits right now today, and, and I, I know this because I actually looked it up for another reason for a report that mm -hmm. I was working on, we have 444 devices still out among our community and our, our students, and that's down from you know closer to yeah. 500. Mm -hmm. So that's either people who turned in devices because mm -hmm. they didn't need them, they realized they didn't need them, or we did have some exchanging that occurred for other things. But I just thought that speak spoke well to um, to our community. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Well, I, I know that the law gets involved in this, uh, the legality of meetings for them to be public. Uh, you know, we have a couple of board members, school board members that go to church with us. And uh, um, I know that they had to have their public meetings. And, mm -hmm. and uh, how, how did, I mean, I didn't know the word Zoom except go fast <laughs> yeah. uh, until just a, you know, a few weeks ago. Yeah. How did you make that happen? For, I know all the board members got to be, they're real technical savvy. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was interesting. I will say that we had early conversations, Mike and I, about what that was going to look like, and we at first didn't really know. And then we started looking at direction from OSBA, uh, outside entity, the OSBA is Oregon School Board Association. They're an organization that helps our school board, um, helps train school board members, mm -hmm. and gives us guidance on certain things and what have you. So we quickly realized, and we also, um, I will say in the world of technology, and this applies here too, Oftentimes, someone else has had that same problem, and 
in this particular situation, that was not necessarily the case, but you can always go like, what are other people doing? Yeah. So we did some pooling and we realized that other groups, other districts were looking at this product called Zoom. And so we um, enlisted that help and we got Zoom involved. Uh, we had two principals who were uh, already using it and got us up to speed on it and still host our admin meeting. They're the ones who actually launches it because <laughs> yes. we do virtual Zoom meetings for our admin team. Mm -hmm. um, so we launched Zoom as the platform for our public meetings. And then I had to uh, scramble. We did delay our first our, our first regular school board meeting that would have been on the books. Had to be, I think it was delayed for two weeks, mm -hmm. um, which was which was appropriate because literally the the COVID nineteen hits. We're hearing that schools are going to be closed. The first school board meeting was within that first two weeks. Ah. It would have been near impossible to even know what. To, you know have a meeting so we just we knew we had to yeah. delay it so we did we delayed it but we knew we were going to have a meeting so it got delayed we did all the notices to make sure that's appropriate and we did all that so i um the our meetings are happening on a wednesday on monday i'm visiting one-on-one -on -one, either via the phone i did swing by a couple people's homes uh because you know i want to make sure our board members are up to speed uh -huh. and uh um it was actually kind of fun. It was neat to visit with those guys. I've known a lot of them for many years, and they're all really good people. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they were eager to learn how this Zoom sure. piece worked. Um, the, our first meeting was kind of interesting because uh, with Zoom, you can either do a, what's called a gallery view or you can do a speaker view. And the speaker view only shows who's talking. Yes. The problem with that is, and this is, this is kind of funny because in the middle of the meeting, I had to kind of remind... Go to gallery view <laughs> because you're not seeing everybody. Yeah. So you have someone who's being polite, not wanting to interrupt. With Zoom, you kind of have to. Yeah. Sure. To get someone's attention, you yeah. sort of have to interrupt. It's uh, like, oh, Mike, I have a question. You know, Mike's yeah. our, our, our board chair. Um, or, you know, yeah, or sure. perhaps they have a comment they want to make. So you sort of have to, you, you have there with your hand up and no one notices you because they don't, they can't see they it. Can't see it. Yeah. So there was a little bit of that learning curve, but it was, it was actually, uh, and, and I'm, I was very nervous because by the time we did have our first meeting, there were the stories coming out about that Zoom bombing, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, not bombing in the sense that someone took over a meeting and, yeah. and hijacked it and did awful things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't yeah. want that. That's that's going to be not good. Sure. So we had a lot of safety precautions and I, I felt like I was the guy sitting in the bunker with the with the kill switch, <laughs> ready to kill the meeting. If anybody, if anything yeah. happens, I can turn off this meeting because we were live. Yeah, that was sure. the other thing is that we wanted to involve our community. So we were live broadcasting mm -hmm. them. And so um, the meetings were being broadcast live and I could see the live feed. And uh, our first meeting, we actually increased viewership up to 12 people, ah. which is actually impressive because yeah. and i wondered if this was going to be the case and it ended up being this way our regular board meetings three people maybe yeah four um if mike chooses to do something controversial it's eight yeah <laughs> um you know that's what yeah. draws people out really mm -hmm. is sadly that's what folks tend to come to meetings yeah, for sure. is because they have an issue with with something this allows them to sit at home and view the meeting and actually in, in, and just view it and sure. enjoy it. So mm -hmm. we had 12 viewers that first meeting and that was really, that was really neat. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have any comments, uh, so I have no idea if it was, if they enjoyed watching it, but <laughs> I made the assumption. Well, we know those meetings can be so exciting. <laughs> exactly. Uh, really? Anytime really. you get Robert's rules of order yeah. that dominates, I mean, it's just lots of tension. And lots yeah, of yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, read, you know, I've had people that, uh, from church that tell me they're now enjoying coming to the worship service <laughs> in their bathrobe, sitting in their recliner. <laughs> so now we're trying to figure out how we're going to, you know, incorporate that into. So maybe that's a, a something way that the board meeting can be visited from now on. Yeah, it could be. I, I actually see this as a new norm in the sense yeah. that when we do get to the point where we do back to brick and mortar meetings, brick and mortar meeting, we're actually in a mm -hmm. meeting room that live broadcasting it seems to be a good way to have our community involved because you yep. also have folks who uh, aren't able to get out of their home mm -hmm. but yet are very civic minded and still want to be a part of their community so this sure. is a great way to connect with I them. I agree I agree I think we are all experiencing that let's switch mm -hmm. tracks a little bit look at the facility side all the san sanitizing of everything mm -hmm. that both of you've mentioned any ideas what you're going to have to do start this fall yeah, that's an interesting, um, so there, so, uh, 
the Oregon Department of Education at Cold Gill specifically was in an interview over the weekend, and I caught this where I saw where he said that the Oregon Department of Ed, and and of course we knew this from other sources, of course, is that they're working on guidelines for the fall because they recognize that the fall is going to be here in what ninety days or something. Yeah. So you got to be planning for it now. And so we really don't have any strict guidelines yet, but the guidelines is an interesting word. Is it a directive or is it a guideline? Because if it's a guideline, then that means that some decision making still have to happen on the local level. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, you also have to look at like, well, what other districts are doing? Are we out of, are we out of touch with what other districts yeah. are doing? What have you? So there's a lot of pieces that are still in play, a, a huge amount of pieces, sure. but there's also some givens. Uh, and I think, I think I, I'll just share two givens that, that I've seen consistently that I, I don't believe are going to go away. And that is online learning. There's, there's going to be a, some sort of distance learning, online learning occurring in the fall mm -hmm. next year. It, there's just going, it just seems natural that there will be some combination somewhere there. There's also going to be increased sanitation. That's a given too. There's going to be increased sanitation. Um, what that means though is for me, I'm looking at, I'm a planner and Mike mentioned this a while ago and I actually, uh, I appreciate the fact that he has that same philosophy because one of the things that I have in the back of my mind that I, I think it was, uh, I think it was a phrase that was made for famous by Ronald Reagan. Uh, you, you hope for the best, but you plan for the worst. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. I hope okay. for the best, but I plan for the worst. And so I look at the fall and I have three or four scenarios in my head already of what mm -hmm. those scenarios might be. But I can tell you sanitation and cleaning is going to be one of them. It could be that, um, you know, we may be looking at needing extra help. Maybe that's in, uh, relying on more subs to come in yeah. and help us. But it, it's a given that we're going to be cleaning as the day goes on. The traditional model of doing certain cleaning at the, in, at the end of the day may have to be shifted and done during the day. Yeah. So we want to, we want our students and our staff to be safe. We want our doors to be open and we want the folks to feel comfortable to be there. Mm -hmm. And we don't want them to feel uncomfortable. We don't want them to be unsafe. Okay. So yeah. are there any, any, uh, either maintenance or repairs that you've actually been able to do because you're not having students in the building right now? It, yeah, actually there is. Um, we were able to do some painting. Mm -hmm. uh, normally we don't get into hallways to do painting in this time of year because sure. school's in session. Uh, we painted an entire fifth grade hall at the uh, elementary school. We painted all the uh, classrooms, or excuse me, all the bathrooms in the fourth and fifth grade hall. Um, some of those bathrooms hadn't been actually wholesale painted mm -hmm. uh, for 10 years. They've been touched up paint yeah. here and yeah. there, or one wall of that bathroom got painted, but not the whole mm -hmm. entire room. And we actually applied two coats of a primer on there that's a sealing primer that helps with um, sanitizing mm -hmm. the room, and then we let that dry. So it was a real process because sure. anybody who's painted knows you do one coat, you got to let it dry before you add the second coat, then you do a second coat. So if you do two coats of primer, yeah. and this is thick primer that helps seal the room, um, you know, then you come along and actually choose the color. Um, and any, you know, any incoming fifth graders, or fourth graders, just a spoiler alert, the, the class, the bathrooms are very bright now. Ah, good. Uh, yeah, they were... Uh, <laughs> I had heard over the years, and I completely understand it, that the rooms felt dark. And we had adjusted the lights in there, but they mm -hmm. still felt dark. Well, it was because it was a darker gray. Yeah. And so I realized we can't do the gray anymore. We needed to do something bright. So I, um, um, we painted them yellow. <laughs> wow. Very bright yellow. Uh, but it's a fun yellow. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fun anyway. You know, I have two kids that, that uh, one just graduated from high school and one's there. And we keep hearing about the need for increased safety yep. at the high school. What's going on out there about that? Yeah, in that that's, regard? yeah, there is some safety issues, safety measures being put in place at all three of our facilities. But mm -hmm. I will say at the high school specifically, we have, um, it's going to have a whole new look um, in the fall because we're putting in a wall. Ah. Um, <laughs> that term build a wall it's like you have so many ways of people going down that but in this particular case people who are familiar with the high school in our community know that we have one massive courtyard mm -hmm. now that school was built in the, in the mid 60s and early 60s or i'm sorry mid 60s and we occupied it in the late 60s so it has a very open floor plan and it has a very feel to it that doesn't fit the modern times now of what we need to do where we need to have controlled access mm -hmm. to our facilities and so we had an opportunity and actually Mike uh, brought a vision that was very that was very cool in the sense that he came from an environment where 
uh, when he was at Sheldon High School, they had an open courtyard very similar because Sheldon was a, probably built around the same time. Yeah. Um, and so they closed off their courtyard and they did it in a very constructive way in a very um, uh, a way that was very friendly to the staff and the students, but yet provided the safety. So we were looking at a similar situation at the high school. So we have a wall that's going to be going up, two walls actually, that's going to enclose the courtyard and essentially give the high school something it's never had. And, and, I, and this is going to sound weird to say this because people are going to be like, oh no, it's had that. But if you think about it, it hasn't. The high school's never had a front door. <laughs> Right. It hasn't. It's had several front doors. It's yeah. never had a front door. It's had yeah. any number of front doors because the gym has four different ways to get into it. Uh -huh. The office has two different ways to get into it. Each academic hall has four different ways to get into it. The locational building has six different ways. To, so it had several front doors over the years. But by clo enclosing the, um, the, the uh, courtyard, you're actually creating an entry point that's going to become the front door. Yeah. And we're going to have it be to where students will, and staff who are coming in and, and, and community members who are visiting go through those front doors. And uh, during the day, they'll, or during the day, we'll actually have, this is the other safety features that's coming along, is a buzz-in. And uh, some folks, I, I didn't know how the community was going to react to our buzz-in mm -hmm. at the middle school, because our middle school facility has one. Yeah. Because you do have folks who are like, I'm used to just walking right in. We actually didn't have that. We had a very positive reaction at the middle school. People were very open sure. to it. And then I thought, silly things like UPS, with the UPS guy be mad at us. Eugene and Springfield school districts, all their buildings have the buzz in now, mm -hmm. where you have to be, during the day, you have to be buzzed into the building. So we added that at the middle school through a safety measure, through a grant funds. Those same grant funds are paying for part of the wall and also for the yeah. buzz in at the high yeah. school. So that means at the high school, not only will we have an actual true front door, <laughs> mm -hmm. we'll have the ability for a community member or a UPS guy or Mike and I to come up and push in a buzz button yeah. and get buzzed in and you'll have a better access, a better controlled access to the facilities. And uh, the courtyard will feel more enclosed and more welcoming in the sense that you could actually do, not that they haven't done this already, but they could do even, they could start doing things in the courtyard that maybe they couldn't do in the past sure. because it was so open. Mm -hmm. So it's really, that that's in a nutshell what's going to happen at the, it's happening right now at the mm -hmm. high school and in the fall, there'll be uh, new focal, focused entry ways with a buzz in. And then, you know, we already pretty much everything we did at the middle school is already in place. There's some okay. incidental yeah. cameras and lighting that's going to be improved. Uh, but the elementary school, to pivot to that, because it's the same, same funding is going to help with this, safety measure grants, um, we're going to try to put in a buzz system mm. at the elementary. So yeah. that all three of our facilities have the same entryway uh, buzzing in. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's going to be a big uh, win to our mm -hmm. students, our staff, and our community. Good. Thank you so much. What, what are, is there anything you need from the community? You know, I, there's not, off the top of my head, the first thing I think about when I have someone ask me that, because I have, I have folks ask me that, mm -hmm. and, and I will say I actually appreciate the fact that they ask me that, mm -hmm. because that tells me that they have a kind heart and that they're looking at their community. Mm -hmm. And I will say that's usually the first thing I reply back with, is that just that continued kind heart, that continued look at what can I do to help you? Uh, what can I do to make this better for us as a community? Because I think folks do recognize that we're not an island in ourselves, that mm -hmm. the school district is made up of students who are part of the community. And so the first thing I answer that is just that continued spirit of wanting to help when they can, whether it's volunteering to be coming in to read a book, mm -hmm. whether it's volunteering to help um, be out in the parking lot helping with parents who on their first days, those kindergartner parents, it's their very first yeah. day. They've never dropped a kid off in their life to school. That's an emotional day for them. Having a seasoned mom out there or a seasoned dad to yeah. say, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I'll hold the camera and take a picture of both of you in front of the door. Cause that happens a lot. Sure. You know, so those continued people volunteering and willing to help is where I think in a nutshell, the school really, because it's a lot of little things mm -hmm. because it could be 15, 20 minutes of your time. But if you have 10 people doing that, mm -hmm. yeah. what an impact that is. Sure. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, I, interesting thing about our district that I think some people don't really realize, and I had a conversation with uh, the city manager about this the other day, it, but it, it gives an understanding of where I look at when I think about our school and how important it is what we do things there, is that 
the, that during the day, we really are, Crestwell didn't used to be this way, but, and I've been in this community all my life, and I was on the Chamber of Commerce board for many, many years, and so I support local businesses as much as I ever can, but the reality of it is, is we're no longer a sustained our own island of a community. Mm -hmm. We really are a bedroom community. That's important because what that means is during a typical day, the biggest population in Crestwell is within the walls of our school district. Yes. The biggest population. I mean, and people are like, oh, what? And I was like, think about that. Right. The majority of our parents and mm -hmm. folks are at work. So they're entrusting us yeah. to take care of their students. Their, well, our students, their, their kids. And so kind of circling back to that, you know, where people say, what can we do to help? It's just having that spirit of willing to help mm -hmm. is what I look at. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Joel, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, we yeah. appreciate it. I, uh, I jokingly uh, say, you know, this is my program to give to you. I joke at that because the truth is I could do nothing without Brianna and without her knowing exactly what ought to happen. And I think, Mike, I'm hearing you say that that your desire to connect with students and show them care and to help them continue to learn couldn't happen without this man. Absolutely. Critical. Oh, Critical to the district. Awesome. Again, so Mike, thank you for being here. Joel, thank you. Thank you. I uh, look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching this.